morning. My name is Adam Shoemaker and I'm rector here at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in downtown Charleston. And it's a joy to welcome you to worship on this, the fourth Sunday of the Easter season. Next weekend, May the 1st, will be the electing convention to elect our diocese's next bishop. And so I invite you today and throughout the week to keep all of the voting delegates in your prayers as well as all of our five bishop nominees. And if you would like more information uh, on our upcoming bishop election, I invite you to visit our diocesan uh, bishop search page, scbishopsearch.org. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desire is known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose Son, Jesus, is the Good Shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson comes from Acts. Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him but you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading comes from the first letter of John. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Just as he has commanded us, all who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in us. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. 
The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this commandment from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the Good Shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. They will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. What beautiful imagery we have in our scriptures today. Our psalm is one that many of you may know by heart. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I know that those words have been a comfort to me and I'm sure to many of you as you've walked in that valley of darkness. And our gospel reading today is also greatly comforting. It is Jesus's discourse on the Good Shepherd the assurance once again that yes, the Lord is our shepherd, the one who gathers us together, the one who is willing to lay down his life for us, willing to give everything for his sheep. And we hear the good shepherd has other sheep, sheep that are not of our fold. Does that surprise you this morning to hear Jesus say to a group of his fellow Jews that he has other sheep who know his voice? Think about this for a moment. In a tribal culture, one that had the strictest divides between in-groups and out-groups, Jesus says to a group of fellow Jews, y'all ain't all. Whatever boundaries that you think exist between you and other ethnic groups say, well, that doesn't matter one bit when it comes to the Good Shepherd. He has other sheep in different sheepfolds. In his heart, the Good Shepherd has one flock. And I love that this passage comes in the midst of John's gospel. This is because John, perhaps more than the other gospels, reflects the painful history of the schism that occurred between the earliest Jewish followers of Jesus and those Jews who chose to remain in the synagogues practicing their traditional faith. After all, the earliest followers of Jesus were indeed Jews, and they claimed a full Jewish identity while also following the teachings of Jesus and proclaiming the resurrection. The split that happened between these two groups, these two groups that had a lot in common, a lot of similarities, the early Jewish Christians, and then the main body of the Jewish congregations, 
this split was a deeply painful and protracted process. It ripped apart families. It divided friends. It led to serious trauma and lasting pain. I know that folks in the Episcopal Church in South Carolina understand schism and so can understand perhaps a bit of the pain that is running like an undercurrent through the Gospel of John. Now, I don't want to simplify or over-identify with the situation in early Jewish-Christian relations. There is a lot of complexity there, and there is a definite lack of saintliness among Christians in terms of how that relationship plays out in scripture and tradition and history. But I do think that it is interesting that for these early Jewish Christians who are having this experience of schism, of painful rejection and loss and trauma and strife, they felt it was important to preserve and record these words of Jesus in their gospel. I am the good shepherd. I have sheep that are not of this fold. Part of what happened to that earliest Jewish Christian community, along with their schism from the synagogues, was that they opened up their communities to Gentile membership. They began welcoming in non-Jews. Think about the scandal that must have been in the wider community. These were definitely sheep from another fold. These Gentiles were not folks who would have mixed with Hebrew ethnic with the Hebrew ethnic group before. In fact, in many Hebrew Bible stories, that kind of mixing of people and culture, well, that often was a sign that the Hebrew people had gone astray. There was powerful cultural and religious conditioning going on against opening up to the Gentiles. But these early Jewish Christians did it anyway. They welcomed these sheep from another fold. But of course, there was a lot of ink spent during this process, a lot of arguments and, and conversations recorded in scripture about how the new community should handle these new sheep. Did the Gentiles coming in have to be circumcised? Did they have to keep Jewish dietary law? And if these Gentile Christians didn't have to do these things, what about the Jewish Christians? What should they do about their customs now that their group, their in-group, was no longer homogenous? These debates over dietary law and circumcision, they may sound strange to us now, but they were major sources of theological conflict at the time. They were of the same importance as some of our debates as a church in recent memory. Should women be ordained? Should LGBTQ folks be part of the full life of the church? What does it mean that parishes are still so often self-segregated along racial lines? I think all of these wonderings and all of these questions we keep debating, I think it all really boils down to a basic fear. On the one hand, we want to follow Jesus. We want to do better and be better and extend welcome and be one. And we are afraid that it means we will have to change in the process. And change is hard for everybody, for every person and for every institution. Even the most positive change you could imagine, like the addition of a planned for and prayed for child to a family, 
that can be really stressful. And if that kind of positive change is stressful, how much more stressful is it to expand our circles to include folks who are different to us in some substantial or significant way? We now have to question our assumptions, our presuppositions, our histories, our customs. Suddenly, the things that we took for granted are open for questioning, are open for interpretation from folks who are different from us and who might draw different conclusions. They might start asking that we do things differently, that we shift to accommodate them. And that may well be uncomfortable or maybe even painful or maybe just really scary. And so it is human nature to avoid this kind of change and discomfort. It is far easier for me to draw a line in the sand and say that those people are not part of my flock. That way I don't have to think about those people and their differences and, and what they say and believe. And that honestly makes my life a little bit easier trying to include them, trying to welcome them, or at least understand them, at least try to come alongside them. Well, that means I might have to change my beliefs or maybe even my behavior. That's human nature. But for me, the good news is that God is not this way. And that with God's help, we don't have to be that way either. What I take from the Good Shepherd discourse is that whenever we draw that line in the sand to keep people out of our fold, Jesus will be standing on the other side of that line, caring for his sheep. Drawing a line separates us from other sheep, but it also distances us from experiencing the fullness of the Good Shepherd's presence. Drawing those lines based on categories of gender or ethnicity or race or sexual or gender identity or political affiliation or any other identifier, well, that impoverishes us all. That cuts us off from God's beloved sheep in other sheepfolds. Because the truth is, those who have been rejected by the institutional church or other groups of people, well, they might have been cast out by the sheep, but they will never be abandoned by the Good Shepherd. Folks who have been rejected from their families or from their friends. Well, they have been shunned by the sheep, but they are cherished by the Good Shepherd. Now, yes, there is a reality that sometimes in the institutional church or in other groups, we might have to draw a line in the sand for safety or for healthy boundaries in situations with individuals. I'm thinking of those cases where someone is violent or could be a danger to the other sheep in the fold. But friends, we should draw those lines only rarely and with deep grief. And we should never make the mistake in thinking that even if we have to draw a necessary line, that that means the Good Shepherd doesn't love that other person deeply. No sheep is disposable in the Good Shepherd's eyes. No sheep will be abandoned to the valley of darkness. No sheep will be forsaken forever. Whatever fold you are from, you are beloved by the Good Shepherd. Know that he wants to lead you into green pastures and by still waters and through the valley of the shadow of death. 
and know too that the Good Shepherd wants, more than anything else, to dwell with you and with all his sheep in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Please join me now in affirming our faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Prayers of the People In this Easter season, we pray for the Church, including Bishop Curry and Bishop Parsley. We pray for St. Mark's in Charleston. In the spirit of reconciliation, mediation, and the way of love, we pray for St. Michael's in Charleston, whom we long to be together with in mission and purpose. We pray for the Diocesan Standing Committee and the Diocesan staff. We pray also for our nominees to be our next Diocesan Bishop, the Reverend Jeffrey M. St. John Hoare, the Reverend Kevin Allen Johnson, the Reverend Canon Terence Alexander Lee, the Venerable Calhoun Walpole, and the Reverend Canon Ruth M. Woodliffe Stanley. We pray for the earth, the world, those in need, and all members of God's family, responding to each petition with the words, Hear our prayer. We pray, O God, for all the churches around the globe, for their bishops and clergy, for the newly baptized, for the believers who cannot assemble for worship, for faithful endurance during this time of sorrow and distress, and for a deepening sense of your presence among us. O oh God, you are temple in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the well-being of creation, for the health of seas and rivers and lakes, for the Ashley and the Cooper, and for the will to care for your earth. O oh God, you are our rainbow of promise. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for peace and justice in the world, for an end to war and international turmoil for concord in our troubled society, for victims of racial injustice and gun violence, for the heads of states, legislatures, and civic leaders that they may enact wide procedures to deal with the coronavirus. O oh God, you are our mighty fortress. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for all who are facing the coronavirus, for all who mourn their dead, all who have contracted the virus, 
those who are quarantined or stranded away from home, those who have lost their employment, those who fear the present and the future. We pray for physicians, nurses, and home health aides, medical researchers, and the World Health Organization, filling the aching in our hearts with your merciful power. O oh God, you are our everlasting arms. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for all in need, for those suffering for the faith, for those who are poor, hungry, and homeless, for those who are sick and those awaiting death, and for those we name before you here. O oh God, you are the healer of our every ill. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the desires of your hearts, and especially for David Williams, Janine Fiedler and family, Mary Lou Titus, Mary Lou Thompson, Rose Adams, Peg Gump, Bill Murray, Donna Labraska, William Ravenel, Mike Callahan, Brett Barnum, Katie Garrett and family, Maeve, and Violet Adams. And for those serving our country, including Malik Spruill, Tyrese Watson, Letitia Watson Franks, Edward Pritchard, Herbert Jordan Drayton, Nicholas Loving, Ryan Savage, and Bill Gibson. Receive our thanks for all who died in the faith, especially remembering Adam Toledo and Dante Wright, as well as the victims of the mass shooting in Indianapolis. And bring us at the final resurrection into your everlasting life, where sorrows will be no more. O oh God, our beginning and our end, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your gracious and mighty hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God.
join me now in reciting a portion of Psalm number 63. O God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. Therefore I have gazed upon you in your holy place, that I might behold your power and your glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live and lift up my hands in your name. My soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. And now some of our church's children and youth will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. O Father, who art in heaven, I will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. In union, O Lord, with faithful Eucharistic people throughout the world, we offer you our thanks and praise. We present to you our souls and bodies, earnestly desiring that we may always be united with you, you promise, O Christ, to be present with us in the sacrament of your body and blood. So, with confidence, we claim your presence among us during this Eucharistic fast. Come into our hearts and unite us with you and one another. May your healing grace abound. Let nothing ever separate you from us. May we live in you and you live in us, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. And now, together, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, Redeemer, and Giver of life be with you this day and always. Amen.
Alleluia. Let us go forth in the name of the risen Christ. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thank you.